<laughs> okay. So I'm still oriented. I'm still get, get I'm still getting oriented to the to the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. I keep forgetting. It's still early for you guys. Yeah. 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 It's 930. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. I've been on the computer for an hour and a half. So I was listening to Osprey and I forget the rest of her name, but she's uh, an American Indian woman who's um, really coming up um, in prominence and stuff and what she's doing. She's written a new book called um, The Stories in Your Bones. The Stories what? In Your Bones. I like it. So it's a, sort of a history of the dance between colonialism and and an indigenous viewpoint. No, she's had a lot to say. It was really wonderful. It was very good. Oh, here comes good. Mark. Good. I've been seeing him in other places, so I wondered if we'd see him today, whether he's back. There he is. Hi, Mark. Hey. You are back. Good afternoon and good morning. Good morning, yeah. yeah. Saw you in other places, so I was hoping you'd be back here. Yeah, I just got back to Rhode Island on Wednesday after after travel. Hmm. You say after a trauma? After travel. 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 Yeah. I was okay. I was on the West Coast for most of April. Right. Yeah. How's it like to be in Rhode Island? Do you like being there? I'm not sure I caught all of that, but um, yeah, I do enjoy California um, and have oh, you're no. going, you're going in and out. Yeah, you're frozen. Rats. I. Uh, Kat, Catherine, as you spoke, I I wrote, I take notes, and co colonialism is the word that landed on my page. Yeah. And it is so interesting. It, every time I hear that word, it's like, I see where we've all come from mm -hmm. and our, our frame of reference. And um, how we need a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And how we have colors everything. Um, power over. Woo! Yeah. Control of. We're, we're still not completely free of that framework no. at all. Far from no. it. No. And it's also remarkable what doesn't happen when colonialism is um, is contained. I was seeing a video this this morning about Pap Papua New Guinea, and the highlands is a mountain range that divides the country. You know, it's a spine. Right. And it's it's almost impenetrable in in certain areas even today, but definitely was during the high point of say Dutch, you know, colonialism in the 1600s, 1700s. and um, consequently, there's like eight hundred different languages still spoken. Wow, wow. Uh, on, on on the you know in the country, and like there are two lingua. Uh, what are they lingua front <laughs> no, you know, accepted languages for the entire country, English and sort of a pidgin English, but even only 60, 70 percent of the population speak those. And um even today, you know, the population is almost uncountable. Um and different cultures, you know, you know, are, are common. Now 
what the what the uh, commentator was saying was it makes makes Papua New Guinea one of the most interesting countries in the world for look for studying for acquainting oneself with with humanity you know with with what's possible in the human being because it's um, in many ways untrammeled um, including you know the the natural world flourishes I mean they have more you know, 1% of the land mass uh, of the world or less than, and yet they have 7% of animals. I mean, I don't remember the exact numbers, 5% of different, you know, um, plant species um, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just a very rich, but poverty stricken <laughs> in the words of, you know, our current culture. But very rich society, um, yeah, society, and it's just very interesting. Um, you know, they don't want to change, and of course, you can look back and say, "Well, yeah, most of the indigenous in our country didn't want to change." <laughs> and you pointed out last week just how. It does appear that 99% of, of available tactics for, um, you know, not saving the world, but at least adapting the world and containing climate change are already known by indigenous societies that only we would pay attention. It's, it's quite an... It's it's eye opening to to uh, to be aware of some of these things, um, even though, you know, I'm just taking this from one video I've seen. But I must also say I've read a lot of novels set in Papua New Guinea, New Guinea because they're some of the most exciting, <laughs> <laughs> because of it's just how unknown everything is. It has one of the highest, the shortest runway uh, you know highest air airports the most difficult to fly into in the planet where the runway just stops and you <laughs> hopefully <laughs> you're up or not yeah <laughs> you know it's just full of stories like and i find this ex you know extremely interesting <laughs> that's where the orangutans are having a hard time though isn't it i don't know about that yeah i think there's a uh... I, I believe it's New Guinea. Um, there's been a lot of deforestation in New Guinea also um, from um, palm oil plantations and that kind of stuff. And some of the most poignant photographs I've seen um, was an orangutan on the only standing tree around him. Yeah. With That's... this forlorn, like what happened here, <laughs> look, um, yeah. Now, is that though in the country, Papua New Guinea, or is it in the other half of that island, which is actually part of Indonesia? Yeah, it may be on that half. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's it split like like Haiti. And uh, okay. Public are. Yeah. So, can you relate what you're saying? to the jump off word that we had, which was colonialism. Oh, yeah. well, quite, quite definitely. Um, colonialism was never made a huge impact except along the coastlines in, in, in that country. And so now the results, you know, 200, 300 years later are quite evident. The, what the results? It, it very different from other island nations throughout the Asian Pacific, which the cultures have been totally um, industrialized, modernized, um, and taken over. Taken over by whom, what? The, colon the colonial perspective. Yeah. And the, the colonial way of life. Sure, yeah. way of life, um, economics, and so forth. Yeah, I, when you were speaking, Robert, I was, I kind of cringed at 
how the word modern now really seems to be <laughs> a negative um, as opposed to the whoopee, here we go into the future kind of thing that it's had in the past. It's now like, I don't even want to think about that. It's so um, laden with the whole colonial perspective that, that modern means destruction and that we celebrated that as progress. Yeah. Well, I'll introduce one other idea here, which is that I think the way we're going after AI, you know, wholeheartedly with absolutely no common ground, you know, enthusiasm for studying what the implications are. It's very similar to how the colonial tactics were, you know, exactly. were economically driven and, you know, come hell or high water, you know, go get them. Um, hubris yeah i mean so in other words with within the realm of of modern technological development i mean i think we're it's the same hell for bent you know uh let's go do it for human i mean i don't know what yeah we, we, we've we we've got this yeah yeah um there's absolutely doesn't seem to be any kind of self-reflection going on right. within a common consciousness i mean obviously there is among individuals we don't have a context for it our culture has no context for that kind of humility and we don't treasure community we we put the individual over community so all of the levers that have been historical we've just trashed so there's no reason for us to stop there's no story we can tell ourselves as a culture about slowing down that has any um, cachet at all. There's nothing we treasure enough to allow us to stop and consider. It's all about progress and newness and inventiveness and testing our own muscles and all that kind of stuff. So there's no, no reason to stop. There's just absolutely no story we can tell that would be strong enough to hold back um our excitement and patting on the back um that ai gives us you know another accomplishment for humanity <laughs> um, yeah there's just nothing that that's a bigger story than that and and it isn't a small thing um no, i was huge. astounded to learn that the energy draw for these yes huge, um yes artificial Yes. Intelligence, um, a server, server, um, what do they call them? Factory yeah, that and Bitcoin. They, they, they require immense amounts. And, um, yep. if you start, if, if you start extending out the needs, you know, de dependent upon the type of growth that's being projected it's like three or four times the requirement that we now are projecting ahead to 2050 that we might be able to get with solar farms <laughs> three <laughs> or four times that and nobody yeah. seems to have any desire yep. to even consider these things you know mm -hmm. electric vehicles are also kind of overextending us that that projection has been made and people are starting to say well yeah maybe we need to use hybrids um, but this AI, I very, I haven't heard anyone else mentioned it except for this one physicist, um, Sabine Hoff. What's Hoff? Yes. Well, you know, she mm -hmm. she has brought this up, um, and it appears to me that it's quite. I've also then read up about the energy needs of AI and seen how, you know, huge they are. So. I can imagine that there may be some truth to what she's saying. And it just seems to me that it's uh, it's hubris run amok. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's the same with Bitcoin. Um, when I first looked at it, and that, this was decades ago, I had friends who were in it and I looked at it. I didn't really understand it and I didn't have the time to spend with it. But the more I learned about the energy requirements and the more serious they've gotten, it's just like clear that this can't continue going forward. It just can't. Um, 
So we're we're digging ourselves deeper into holes. At the same time, we're saying, oh, look, we're going over this cliff. Well, let's make it deeper. Let's make it bigger <laughs> that we're going to fall into. It makes no sense. Um, so we are just not taking, um, dealing with reality at all. It's just really interesting. Um, and I think that's part of the, oh, I don't know, sickness, uh, the, the part of the hook to being lemmings, to, to our self-destruction is this total detachment from reality and this belief that if we wish it, we can make it so, that it doesn't have to tie into anything that's alive. That's where reality hits, is where life is. Life is the, the arbiter of reality in actuality. And the less we pay attention to it, then the more we can fantasize and be off into these other things. And and I believe that that's truth. Um, and there's no truth there. It's all a fabrication. And it can be even logically consistent, but the premise that it starts from is fallacious. So it doesn't hold water, period. What stands out to me in this discussion is colonial perspective, something about co colonialism, something about a power over. Yeah, Jim Garrison this morning said that Rousseau's statement about where we went wrong was that the first person who looked out over a meadow and said, this is mine. <laughs> that is the root of everything that has... That has yeah, well, it, and being you, you only possess what's not yours, <laughs> because what is you you don't even think of as possession. It is you. Possession is not an issue. It doesn't even come into the conversation. So if you're going to possess it, it's outside of you, and it's that outside of us that separation that's that's the key. Um, yeah, it's just. We, we really have come to believe that, that what we think is more powerful than what is. Um, and that's sort of a corruption of creativity. Okay, Can, may I make a request that from this point forward in this framework, that we create what we want, that, that we create what we want to see through what we have to say because we're, what we're doing is defining something that we don't want. So we've had this conversation before, and I do think that that is what we do, but I also think that the naming and the awareness of what we don't want has a... It's important. It has a gift. Yeah. Is, um, and I think where we talked about before was investing it in emotional reality is what we don't want to do. That it, the emotional reality should be held for what we want to have happen. Sorry, say it again. That we want to invest emotional reality in what we want to have happen, not in what we don't want to have happen. But that doesn't mean that we aren't aware of and can't talk about what we don't want to have happen. Absolutely. Just being real clear about that and yeah. creating what we desire and um, coming to understand better what we don't <laughs> so we can do it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something about colonial has a alarm ring <laughs> to it and has through the ages since what 1492 yeah and that's different than trading with somebody you know or or going out to find other peoples to trade with or to explore the colonial was really to 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 own mm -hmm. to claim ownership of and power over i mean that was the whole point they weren't just curious about what was there they wanted to be the kingpin over there so it's it's that 
approach, being better than. And I like I like your clarifying statement that um, you can only possess what's not yours. But possession, I don't know, something about that, something about that is very, you know, it's packed. Yeah. It's packed full of meaning and history and um yeah i once had a meditation about um how to get uh, considering the question of how to get people to care for things and the only solution i came up with at that point in my life was ownership that if somebody owned something they took care of it um and that was because I had not yet really understood that that's backwards, that you care for things. You don't have to own them. That the caring comes from the connection that you have with something. Right. The innate value that you see, it has nothing to do with ownership. Right. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I still regret that decision a great deal. <laughs> regret it? What? Yeah, it was just, um, it was, yeah, it was very powerfully made at the, yeah, and it should not have been that. It should have been something else, but that's where I was. That was all I could see at the time. So there you are. <laughs> well, when yeah. we realize that everything is part of everything, <laughs> that, that you know, that we're all so connected, kind of, we're of the same entity. When we're willing to stay in the awe of life, I mean, we want to go touch that place because it makes us feel good, but we don't want to live there because it's it's difficult. Then there's all these things you can't do in that state. You can't. Uh, you have to take time. You have to take care. You have to be considerate. You have all those things just naturally flow from that awe state. Um, and when we start thinking about speed and efficiency then we want to sacrifice those things because it's hard to be in awe and in efficiency at the same time. They're kind of mutually exclusive. You know, we choose the efficiency and the speed for life. And then the awe is sort of a vacation, you know, a nice space to go and <laughs> feel good, but you don't want to be there. You don't want to stay there instead of really reversing that, that that is where we should be that you can do efficiency for short periods of time at points in time, but it's not a place to live. Can't do much with that word. What word? Efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been blown away for decades now by um, I don't know, 1492, when when Spain or whoever it was or what said, go and take everything over, <laughs> you know, go and make them like us. If they're not like us, kill them. If they don't want to be, if they don't want to do our no value, then they would just, they don't even count. Yeah. But we, st that we're still, it's still fringy. Our society is fringy around that some kind of way, still as a global species. But we're not mature yet. I, I, I keep having to remember like what Elizabeth Satoris and others, we're not a mature species yet. We're we're in our adolescence still. You know, part of that is self-forgiveness. Being okay with being where we were instead of being wrong with where we were. But 
that doesn't mean we have to stay there. It means we are now clear of having to stay there. <laughs> you know, you could just, you look back on your childhood and it was wonderful. And the thought of going back to that space. I mean, we want to go back to the freedom and the openness and the innocence of everything is great that was there. But if we really went back to that, to being seven or six, all the things we couldn't do would not be happy. You I mean, think that way. Yeah. Yeah. But we do. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of the resistance to accepting the colonialism, um, the resistance to uh, white privilege and all of that is is the feeling that well if I felt that way once I was a bad person because we really do have a judgment around that we do really you know colonialism is bad it wasn't a good thing it wasn't a good thing it it did a lot of damage and it also it was a, a world uniter we now see everybody in a way we never have seen before and we wouldn't have seen from any other approach um, I mean, visiting different cultures as we did before, there were a couple of people who knew there were other cultures. Nobody else knew there were other cultures. Everybody was the people. What are you know, we trying I, to do in this time together? No, well, we were talking about colonization, right? The purpose, yeah, and the purpose be, being more self-reflective and more mm -hmm. creative in our conversation of what we of of what enlivens us <laughs> of, of 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 what we desire what we create by what we're saying it's a fine line between self reflection and and intentional and create creation cre yeah. create what, what is the line between that? How would you characterize those two? Say the question again, please. Well, how would you characterize the difference between those two states? What two states? What were you talking about? Well, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> oh, you were talking about self-reflection and creating what you didn't like and you said there's a fine line between those two so i'm wondering what that fine line is what i wrote down as it was um possession of what is outside we can only possess what is outside of us i i don't know it I, i'm I got lost. <laughs> this is this is a difficult track to follow, and I th the way I would ask the question, hopefully mm -hmm. to guide us in a slightly different way, mm -hmm. is to go back to your prime directive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of a central stabilizing um, vision of you know of agency how how i become an agent in my own life and i would say that what is balanced against such having such a broad you know common you know um vision is individualism um lot of uh, ani you you stated that spain sent you know the, the forces you know to go colonize and take over no they didn't the king and queen did and evidently you know any any study that's been done of you know uh what what what's his name 1492 Col columbus <laughs> I have to use this sometimes these little helps but columbus you know evidently he was an extraordinarily you know Avarice, avaristic uh, individual, you, you know, and and brutal, and and you know, the, these were individuals following their own proclivities, and and not a common culture. We we'd already long left, you know, that kind of sense of belonging to a a tribe, you know, which had common ground that it needed, that it lived from, that it could potentially 
work with an idea as such a broad stroke as you know prime directive <laughs> um you know in other words what what is best for life is also good you know best for us we've long ago left that at in pursuit of individualism is what i would say and you know so the question to me is how do we get back to having a sense of in, you know including ourselves within a larger perspective uh, a body of mankind for instance um understanding that we're all one uh you know species and we perhaps have you know a a directive you know in terms of of how we incorporate our actions into working with the planet and this is brand new thinking so i'm stumbling here but um i i think that it's it's something we need to start thinking about as a population um that you know and every every once in a while you know some, <laughs> someone you know projects this idea out like say Carl Sagan you know and showing the pale blue dot and saying you know that's where absolutely all the people you've ever heard of read about known they all live there and nowhere <laughs> you know that's the kind of perspective that's needed to suddenly accept the fact that you know, we have nowhere else to go and we have no one else except ourselves. And I've always stated that I have, I do not believe for a moment that human beings can think of themselves outside of this earth. You know, they simply can't. We are tethered to this planet and, and how life creates itself and recreates on this planet. We're it doesn't go of, anywhere else. We're we're made of the substance of the earth. Yeah. And I mean, maybe we could colonize, colonize, there you go again, Mars, but only by taking all of the elements, as many of the elements of the earth and taking them up there, then maybe we could do it. That's crazy. Yeah. I'm ruminating on the difference between resistance and inclusion as part of this conversation that um because when you were talking robert i was thinking of japan and um you know the nail that stands out gets pounded down belief um and china where it's very much about the common and and very little about the individual even though they have artists and they do celebrate people who are special there's you don't want to go outside the norms in so many ways. And so much of the Western belief system is a rebellion against that. That's what kind of individualism is, I think, in a lot of ways, is a rebellion against the, the amorphous mass, <laughs> you know, being giving up who you are to the greater good and that kind of stuff. And there's there's got to be, there's a tension there and there's got to be um, a skillfulness and a finesse around that because it's a both and, it's not an either or. And we keep pushing ourselves into one side or the other instead of being able to hold both of those. And I think that's part of where we are is to complete that, um, to make it really a full circle where everything is equal in its own time as opposed to it's one side or the other. Um, I I know for me, <laughs> what balances, what balances me, what's regenerative for me is the awareness and embrace of the fact that I'm part of everything, that everything that is, is I mean, that, that um, there's one, whole that we're all part of i mean that that um settles me balances me because if 
when I am aware of that, I, it's, I, everything's okay, you know? But you also never deny yourself. Because I'm part of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, for me, I'm the, I'm the essence of it, but, but the essence, but I'm sharing essence with you, with everything, with the TV, I mean, the monitor. I mean, it's all part of, it's all biochemical arousal of shapes and sizes and vibrations and functions and <laughs> yeah i mean we needed to step away to see the whole like we needed to get outside of earth to see that blue dot and yet at the same time we need to stay inside i mean it's a both and there's this yeah. this dance that needs to constantly happen yeah uh, and to honor both i'm um, I wonder what, how to tell that story in a way to help people who feel the shame and guilt of the of the pain that the stepping out has caused and the destruction that it has caused. To help people who feel that to be able to come back inside and love themselves without giving up the skills that we have for stepping out. I mean, it's this both and how to do that in a way that doesn't um, demean the accomplishments that we have achieved, even though we have to stop doing a lot of the things that we're doing in the way we're doing, um, but still appreciates the the journey i don't know i'm stumbling too but a simple way to put it to me is not be human centric because how you're speaking right now is human centric i mean it's what you're saying is valid but it's still human centric so it's not valid because humanity is not the center of creation yeah We're, we're just part of it, and it's part of us. So, Mark, you got thoughts? I know you have thoughts. Will you share them? So many. Um, the most um, recent thought was um, Robert Fritz and Structural Dynamics, and the quote something like, when you're in a structure, it's hard, it's to, hard hear to see you. the structure. It's hard to hear when you're in a when you're in a structure, it's hard to see the structure you're in. And so, like, we need to get out of the structure to see the structure we're in. But to your point, Catherine, then we need to get back into it. Mm -hmm. I I can't get out that of that understanding. We can't get out of the structure we're in since our bodies is the structure. That's part of everything. I mean, that's just. I guess wild. I was mostly thinking about. Um, what? You know, I was mostly thinking about um, uh, the the blue planet, uh, the blue marble. So when we left planet Earth and had the first photo back of of, of Earth, there was an example of us doing it, and then get back in it and use that knowing. I'm not sure what you just said. What did you just say? Some so what I, what I heard him say, so check me, Mark, was that when we got out of the earth and saw ourselves from space, that would, by coming back in to earth with that understanding, it changes how we see ourselves because we understand that we're the only, there's nothing around us, we are it, <laughs> you know? in a way that we hadn't maybe really got before. We could say those words, but to see the earth sitting there in the middle of space is just a very different than just saying, yes, we're we're all on the planet and the planet is one, that's nice to say, but to realize there's nothing, there truly is nothing else in such a dramatic way. Did I do justice to your thoughts or did I scramble them? 
<laughs> I I like being aware that I'm cosmic in origin. Yeah. Uh, I I purposely go go there. In in you know cuz I like so it. What do you think of the uh, belief that aliens are intermarrying? I don't care. I I I don't even address it. It's not it doesn't come into my you know, I'm letting it pass by. <laughs> well, I actually think it's kind of exciting. I hadn't um Given the the thinking that I've done in, in recent months on how cells have gone from single cells to multi-celled critters and that they're composed of individuals who make that choice to be together and to collaborate in those ways, I don't see any difference between that and intermarriage, that that is how that would happen at this level of organization, that all our cells and all their cells would make those agreements with each other. That's what it is. I mean, it just sounds perfectly natural to me. And who knows what the outcome is? I mean, we never know what the outcome is. That's sort of the experiment, right? Whenever two things come together, new things are released that nobody knew were potential before that. So it's kind of interesting that I think the consternation that people feel is the lack of control, you know, like we're not choosing it, we're not doing it, we're not designing it, it's happening to us, um, is again, that both and peace. That's exactly what it is because nature has its own way. We're composed of all these little things that aren't us. They're doing their own thing. We're not controlling that either. Um, and we have some sadhus who work really hard to try and control bits and pieces of their body and they can do that. Um, but as a lifestyle, there is, a, again, a both and. you And I've had this ex experience where, I don't know, you get little moles and little skin tags and that kind of stuff. You can get rid of those by just really not wanting them. But you have to really not want them. And they'll just disappear. Because they're living things, too. Nobody wants to be where they're not wanted. That's just absolutely truth. So that's the way to do that. Um, and Bernard Shaw said, oh, let's, let's grow, let's experiment. Let's grow four arms. Wouldn't it be fun to have four arms? I mean, there's always times when we've thought if I only had another one, it would be really useful. What's your point? <laughs> the difference between, I don't know, difference, being able to integrate the agency of autopoiesis, the intentfulness and willfulness and egoic aspects of autopoiesis with the reverential surrender and reciprocity that comes with being in community with other life, that it is always a both and, that everything is created that way. And we keep flopping over from one side to the other. And when we do, every time we go to one side, we get hiccups. It I doesn't... really don't know what you're saying. I don't know your framework. Life. <laughs> How living things live with each other. Well, that's autopoiesis. You're so smart for tuning into today's episode of Why Isn't <laughs> Yeah, I, I get Zach Bush. I don't know who Emily Fletcher is. I'll have to... She, um, I don't know, she's a, she's what taught me my meditation technique. Oh, okay. She's got an extremely expressive face, but I shut it off. I didn't want it to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> she's in, in the but... chat, Ani. Yeah. There's a link in the chat. Mark put a. I was I was just thinking of Jane Jane Goodall and her her experience of the blue dot 
or perhaps the apes, the great apes experience of the blue dot, <laughs> was to experience her. Who are these aliens that are coming in? Well, it was mostly just her, but then she had guests. That, that kind of interchange, which was on, on an emotional level for her, uh, from the way she describes it, it, it's considerable. I mean, she had a deep dive experience, you know, with these creatures, you know, the the uh, the, the gorillas, and um, and I can think of a few others. A friend of mine who has written a book, asked to write a book by a a, um, a seer, you know. A, from Mexico, and um, he um, he asked her to write a book, and well, to do that, she had to come and live with him for a certain amount of time, and you know, experience the place because it was all about place for him, and which she did, and she's a stalwart now, ninety year old English woman. <laughs> certainly did make a shift in her consciousness. <laughs> um, so people are doing these things, you know, are leaping into, a, you know, a sort of a... Alien world. An experience of the other. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, that's very exciting, you know, because I've been asking myself all through this conversation, okay, that's fine. We're delineating, you know, what some of the issues are, but what do we do about it? I think mm -hmm. that's one of the primary things we can do about it. Um, wonder if she's, for me, it's just get it, really getting to know my wife. I mean, she just- There she is. So <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I mean, it's getting to know another person at that level yeah. that we know each other it is truly it's disruptive, you know, to whatever it was that I thought I was before. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it isn't that this is impossible, you know, it's just how many, you know, it's uncomfortable a lot of the time. And yeah. it's kind of outrageous, does outrageous things to our feeling of stability and rightness to the world. Um, but it can be done. And I, I think that kind of interaction is absolutely required, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we move into a state of, well, chaos, chaotic behaviors within the society, it's going to take this kind of exploration to get us out of it. Um, and personally, I see a lot of people doing these things. And mm -hmm. then, of course, the media covers you know, the, the mainstream, which is the norm, so to speak. Um, but I do see a lot of way out of this. I, I'm going to, I'm going to watch this reconnecting with nature by Zach Bush. I think that might be very interesting. Yeah, he's wonderful. He I won't do it now. I've got to get to an appointment soon. But um I think we have some solutions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a solution. We have some avenues of exploration ahead of us. Well, and I, I, one of the points I was trying to make is that it's not so different from things we've al already done or are doing, um, but we haven't reflected on it. And, and because of our addiction to parts and pieces, we often don't see threads between things. We don't see those connecting threads. And they're there. I mean, whether um, it's in the Papua New Guinea dichotomy in that island, you know, where you have half doing one thing and half doing another, uh, or the difference between genders <laughs> and the conundrums that those are for people. I mean, or the Magna Group, um, you know, the, how different that is and understanding that. And being able to see the threads, though, that still connect us, that are still there, because it's always this both and. It's always a both and. It, it's the complexification of everything is interconnected. <laughs> everything <Yeah>. is interconnected. <laughs> 
what com it's one mega complex organism life yeah. is yeah yeah and i respect it it's like it humbles me oh yeah yeah and fills you with awe because it's so not human centric they yeah. nothing human centric about creation no even our own <laughs> And and that feel I like that. That's that's that has a balancing effect. Uh, yeah. That that has a like the soothing effect. Yeah, and that's been one of the gifts of religion is that it takes us out of ourselves a little bit. Uh huh. And that's been you know one of the few places where that happens. Right. So, yeah, that's been a real gift of that. It's uh, and it's I think a longing that we have people who are hungry for that but don't know how to do that without that all the other garbage that's gotten attached to the religious perspective yeah, what what's the other because we want a bigger other and it's always there <laughs> you know, it's always the, there the majesty of life is humble yeah, yeah. And humbling is good for my living system. <laughs> well, yesterday I was talking to some friends, and the one the one statement we could all agree to a similar conversation, actually. She just kept saying, you know, it's all about kindness. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about that word and um, what we all did together. And we realized there's, there's a lot packed into that one word, mm -hmm. that one action mm -hmm. um, in terms of connectedness, uh -huh. and in terms of um, maintaining a connection, an active connection, no matter what. Um, so, so that pass that on it it was we kind of ended our conversation yes yesterday on that note and i i think it's a good one and i do have to leave in a minute <laughs> it's a little early but i got an appointment i gotta make yep okay. always good to hear what you have to say absolutely and i bookmarked this um this Zach Bush thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I see such a face that, as that. She's just totally animated and alive. I got to listen to it. <laughs> but later when I get back. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye and I'll see you all next week. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. Phone call. Yes. Before when uh, in the conversation, I was, um, I think it was something you said, Catherine, um, around like the freedom and joy and sort of innate pleasure we experienced as children. And I was like, I was walking down the street yesterday and I was like recalling that sort of that lightness and just the beingness of being a child. And I was recalling for some reason, like the moment when I felt like I had to do something scheduled. Mm. And for me, it was like being maybe like a sophomore in high school. And I'm like, oh, I actually need to like commit to study if I'm going to do well in this stuff. And so I set up this whole structured, you know, sort of structure around like studying for, you know, national exams and stuff like that. And I was very... um yeah, I planned and I was very diligent about it. And and why I thought about it, I think, is because I didn't enjoy it. And I was like, oh, this is the type of structure we have to create to do something we don't enjoy because <laughs> we're engaging in the world in ways well, that aren't natural. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. I knew something was up when I was a teenager. Yeah. And oh. 
it really only recently clicked yeah. that that was yet another manifestation or expression of or experience of disconnection. I think and, that and that pictures. I had to create a schedule or a habit or a routine to be able to get through it. Yep. Yep. I think that's the angst of high school, actually, for many kids. Um, and and why we see such problems there, because that's the issue. How do I give up myself to be successful in the world? I don't want to do that. Um, and how do you know I'm getting no support to do anything else but that? And so how, what am I supposed to do? You know, what's a good person now? How do I be good in this very conflicting place? Um, um, some people opt out for just that reason, because it's just a bigger deal than they can deal with. Yeah, I love teens for just that reason, because I think that so much of what they're going through is, is that. And we can be so much so helpful in honoring that space. Um, instead of pushing them into doing what they're going to need to do to be successful in the world, but to think through how, how, again, it's a both hand to know yourself well enough to be able to finesse your way through that without sacrificing or sacrificing very little um, and to just figure out how to do that. And, and there's just very little support for that. Yeah, that, that was what my entrepreneur class was all about figuring out how to make money in a way you loved and feeling free that you could just do that. You could create that space for yourself. And I, oh boy, you just got me off. Cause I think that's, that's part of the hook is that people who have gone through that and not lost that understanding, but bought the corruption, get pissed. Like, I had to do that. Why shouldn't you? And so they will actually undermine people finding their own space because they don't, because they couldn't. And they're still pissed about it. I mean, it just, it, it really shows up in interesting ways, um, how you dealt with that. Um, Karen Horney, I believe. Ah, I'd have to check and sure. She wrote oh, a book, the name of which is also escaping me, but it was her doubt into the difference in genders because one of the things that male humans need to do is to discover that they are not their mother and the trauma that is. Because in the womb, you're all one. But when you come out, there's differences sometimes. And if you're different than your mother, you ha that has to be reconciled. And it's often not. Mm. And that adds a foundational layer that colors the life of that individual forever. Whether it's okay, whether they can be different and still love their mother, whether they now have to hate that what they used to love, all those choices that come around that separation, color, everything else. And again, there's no support for it. Everybody does it on their own, totally. Um, some cultures like the Romans used to take kids at seven, bought male children at seven, were moved into the male society so that they didn't attach to women. They didn't get that appreciation they didn't have a chance to they were really discouraged from doing that other cultures have dealt with it differently but that is such a crux women don't do that until teenage years when they separate from the mother and become who they are as individuals versus the mother but it's different it's not as traumatic and it's not as total as it is for guys it's a totally different thing and that's just not um talked about much <laughs> at all but i think it's huge i know this is going to sound awful 
but I want to say it because it's um, it's central to my life. Um, one of the most liberating things in my one um i i stabbed my dad when i was 18 to get him out of the house that was one of the most if not the most empowering activities of my entire life i mean that has that has given me such agency mm -hmm. And it's weird, but it's true. Yeah. And I would like to point out that you stabbed him. You didn't kill him. I I wasn't even mad at him. I just, he just needed to leave the house. I just had to, because it was upsetting mother who was in a nervous breakdown. So he had to leave. Right. And he was agitating her. And that that was a very empowering. Yeah, I, I want you to appreciate what you did there, though. I do. I do. I mean, how? Yeah, it was it was. Oh, I, the word that comes up is pure being yeah. appropriate in a situation without all of the shoulds or woulds or any of that crap making it different than what it was. It was just what it was. Yeah. And and it was what it needed to be at the time, period. Yeah. I I gave myself or I uh, what emerged in my consciousness was a term that I've embraced, I guess. Ultimate arbiter. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate arbiter. Cause I determined the deal that went down. I mean, he left, you know, and that was what needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And 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 so the agency around that, I, I mean, I've I've just become aware of this in the last couple of weeks, but how impactful, how how di directive that has been of my d development. Of, of my maturation as a person with agency. Yep. Because I, I don't think a lot of people are in touch with their agency. No, well, they're, they're encouraged to sacrifice it. <laughs> Right. Well, I I sacrificed it for mother. I mean, my my own. Age. I mean, I I was always helpful. Yeah. Well, you can be always helpful and not sacrifice your agency. I mean, that's the that I that's the key to life, as far as I'm concerned. To un being helpful is not sacrificing your agency. Right. Sacrificing your agency is going against what you know is right. Yeah. And whatever oh. label you have with it, you can make it helpful. You can make it duty. You could make it honor. You can make it loyalty. You can have all these labels. But when you sacrifice yourself for that, it's wrong. I don't care what it is. I agree. Ah. <laughs> uh. And that has been hard for me. There are two lessons I've had in this life around that that have been really, really hard. Uh, let's see. I lived in an ashram for a while and the ashram was over a Chinese restaurant. And when the ashram bought that Chinese restaurant. Uh, 
it was a cesspool of stuff. There were rats, there was just all sorts of things which came up into the ashram. And there was a call for if anybody had cats to bring, to put in this cesspool to kill the rats. And I offered up my cat who had nothing to do with this and was not into it. And he split out of there and I, and I never saw him again. And it's tied to a bigger story, which I'm not bringing, it's not coming up, which is really interesting. There's, oh, that's where it came from. Okay. So it, this goes back actually to um, 4,500 years ago. I had a child um, and our town was um, under the authority of uh, Bass, who is a, a brass bull in the Bible. This is how I know how long ago it was. Um, ball, the, the idol ball. The idol ball was a brass thing that had fire in it. And the priest asked for sacrifices and I gave my son Ben to be burned alive by this thing he was not happy with that decision and he was pissed at me until this life when I apologized for that it took me 4,500 years to do that that was my being good from this outside thing being a devotee who was devoted and sacrificing something I also love, my son. We do this all the time. This is, I mean, don't we always kill? We often kill what we love, right? I mean, we love flowers, we love plants, we do pesticides. Our whole culture is built on killing what we love. I mean, that is so fun, fundamental. And if we're told, oh, there's all sorts of stories. If we're told that we're good because we're doing bad things, we'll buy it. We don't trust our own agency, our own self in that. That's why it's such a lesson, such an incredible lesson to trust yourself and to be able to say no when the authority says, please do this for me. And you can say, no, it's wrong. We're not doing that. It is a hell of a lesson to get. Yes, indeedy. But once you got it, you got it. You got it. Yeah, I'm still learning that. Trust me. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, my meditation teacher, we give him gifts. I gave him a sweet grass basket, which I highly cherished. And he picked it up and he tossed it <laughs> to tell me that lesson again. That he didn't value it. I valued it. Why am I giving away what I value? That was not a gift. It was a sacrifice. It wasn't even a sacrifice. It was a destruction. So what's the point? The point is to trust yourself in what you love and to, and to act from that place, not to sacrifice that place because of status or wanting to have others like us, or I don't know what that thread is, that we're somehow less than somebody else. We're be not. True, be true to yourself. Yeah, very much so. Honor, starting yeah. with. Yeah. And you really got that lesson. I mean, that's what that taught you. Yeah. Yep. And somehow that's why I went into juvenile probation to empower. Yeah. Those kids us. need it so much. Um, I mean, when you know, when you're caught with that tension between what you want and what the society is or your family is telling you should have, it's a hard place. It's a really hard place to discover that authenticity. And a lot of kids are caught in it. I mean, they're caught in corrupt family systems yeah. that want them to be nice or bad or whatever, um, instead of who they are. Oh. Um, more valuable than authenticity. Yeah, that's all we have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our bodies, our, our bodies are designed to function best 
with authenticity by yeah. by being true to ourselves. Yeah. I mean, it's an inner guidance thing. Yeah. And it looks really hard when you discover that makes everything else bad for <laughs> bad and wrong because you look at our culture and it just sucks it truly does i mean i sometimes am just awed by how far we've strayed and to have the courage to not go there and to not honor it when you're required to honor it in so many ways is just really hard and especially if those around you that you love don't do still honor all that and don't want you to push that away. Don't want you to be honest about it because it shows up their failings. You know, it's a hard, it's a hard path. But it's the simplest. Yeah. So, yeah. And, it, and it's the most joyous. I've got a book, Anne Wilson Schaaf, I think is her name, when yeah. society becomes an addict. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it was a long time ago. Outside of ourselves. Yeah. Which is something outside of ourselves. Yes. No, no. <laughs> got to start here. <laughs> Got to. Yep. Yep. It's probably time to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good subject, though. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a little story to, to share. I've, the, the new website got 200 hits yesterday. I have never had that many hits on anything I've ever done in my life. So that's kind of exciting. What's the new website? The Soil Smart, Soil Wise. Soil Smart, Soil Wise. Yeah. Dot Come. Org. Well, it will be org. It should be an org. Um, and I didn't know how to do that. Now I do. So it'll be an org soon. But yeah, it's dot com right now. Say it again. Soil smart. Soil smart. Soil wise. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that will have traction. We'll see. And <clears throat> its mission is to bring the biotic pump alive for people to understand how they can contribute to it and to notice their life in that context. Bionic pump. Yep. There's a whole page on it. <laughs> right. <clears throat> it's a it's a system that we're part of, but we have just discovered it actually. It's fairly new science. We knew parts of it and we we know lots of parts of it actually, but we don't connect them at all. And it's just asking people to to see the connection and then to make that connection happen. It will, it's how weather happens where you are locally. So it's how we control the weather. <laughs> and it's one of the things we can do about climate change. And what is that? I mean, that how, would you sum up, how would you express explain it means way. if we have healthy soil and we plant the plants that should be there that we will have water and that's whole that's life so and we're in entering a phase where water is gonna is gonna be a key issue and if we don't have healthy soil we won't have water and that connection is just not understood and and by healthy soil you're talking about 
water infused soil and no soil that will hold water soil that will hold water if soil does not have life in it it will not hold water water goes right through it or won't even penetrate it runs off it so it has to have life in the soil which is compost <laughs> I mean, this is rock, not rocket science, something everybody can do. You don't even have to know much. Um, living stuff in the soil that living that breaks down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And biochar is part of that. So biochar, bacteria, protozoans, fungi, and nematodes are other parts of it. But it has to be alive enough to hold all that. And when it has that, then it will hold water. When it holds water, then we have water, which is what we need. And it and then we'll have rain. Because if we if the plants don't take water up from their roots, they can't give it off from their leaves. So it has to be down below before it will go up. <laughs> so Mark, what are you seeing? Uh, on that page. Yeah, I don't the partners page shouldn't be present yet i should because it's not finished yeah it was clickable so okay so I maybe that's, that's the, the problem yeah. yeah okay i will go back and check that thank you yeah welcome yeah is the um thing you mentioned about the bio pump is that the trifold brochure or somewhere else uh no the tri uh the trifold brochure we'll talk about it um, and there is a page for the biotic pump and I've used, I've really used that. I talked with Alpha Low and he was very disparaging. He does not like the term bio, biotic pump. He wants to use the term small water cycle. Mm. So if you Google small water cycle, you get nothing new. You get the water cycle. Um, but it doesn't, the, the difference is that the water cycle we're familiar with gives us 45 or 40% of the rain. But 65% of the rain comes from the biotic pump, which is all inland, and it's all plants. It's the way plants trans ev evapotranspire, which is a horrible word. That's how that happens. So every time we get rid of plants, we cut down forests or any of that, we're interfering with that cycle, which we prove. We've got lots of research to say, if you get cut down trees, you get desert. Well, this is why. <laughs> And you can put it back by putting the plants back, but you can't put the plants back without the soil. I mean, it is a whole package. You got to have the whole package to make it work. And I haven't found a good diagram for it. So the diagram I have is really the old water cycle. But if you do Google biotic pump, you will get that new conversation. So that's why I'm hanging on to that those words, because if people don't understand it, they'll Google it. That's fine. They'll get the information that they need to have. But small water cycle will not take them there. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It puts it back in our hands. <laughs> And you don't have to give up the rest of your life to do it either. <laughs> what, do you have, what do you have to do? Well, you have to include soil in your life, which is an addition usually. It's, it doesn't have to be your whole life, but you do have to include it. And I just think there's so much. Uh, I mean, it's been sort of a shortcut for me because if you're going to plant, especially if you do the Miyawaki method, then you're getting into community. So it really opens up that conversation in a shared project and a shared commitment with shared values and all that kind of stuff. And when you start paying attention to how life shows up, then there's a sensitivity to life that we've kind of ignored that is brought back into your life, which is why everybody needs to put their hands in the dirt just a little bit. And your body gets fed by that dirt, by the bacteria that are there that they get to be reacquainted with. So, I mean, it's it's a really nice package without saying too much or twisting people's minds too much into all this new stuff. <laughs> but they can still get there and they can get the effects of it, even if they don't know and understand it and can't articulate it. 
but it's a step. It's the first step, easy first step, I think. And from a city perspective, it makes the city resilient in really magical ways. And city water for cities is going to be critical, just huge. And this is the only way cities can really get water. By by what? By creating the sponge that the city rests on as the soil the city rests on as a sponge. So making sponge cities will give them the rain and the water that they need and the greenery that they need to cool in the heat because heat is the issue that we're going to have to deal with. And nature already has a mechanism for making the earth cool and that's the biotic pump. That's exactly what it is. So. Well, we'll keep learning. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm looking for help. If you know anybody who has interest, point them my way. Well, what kind of help? Um, actually, a lot. I need people with more soil and water expertise than I have, who have credentials in that to speak to people, which I don't have, would be useful. Um, people that see the mission and just want to figure out how to play in their area. I mean, the the design right now is that Soil Smart is basically an educational tool. But then if a city wants to do that, who would work with the city to make that happen? So consultant types that have that interest and can work at that level. Yeah, because there's there are a lot of cities that are starting to look at this. I attended a, a webinar yesterday. Uh, the 330-300 rule um, you know, came out of Europe. Um, and so you want to be able to see three trees from where you are and have green space within 30 feet and be 300 feet away from the entrance to a park. And if you design cities that way, then you're getting into the green cover and that's perfect. And it's something designers can recognize and work with and all that. But what's missing in that conversation is the soil piece and how all the things that make that green space healthy over the long term. So hopefully we'll have conversations around that. Yeah, we've got so many pieces, we just have to put them together. I don't know what to get hold of to be helpful in this. Maybe it's not your space. I don't know. You have to trust yourself, you'll resonate. My, I think my, my focus, mission, whatever, um, <clears throat> is just to convey the fact as interestingly and vibrantly as I can that we're all part of the same thing. You just share your story. You do great with that. And you've got lots of pieces. You just have to put it out. I mean, there's lots of learning from the story of your father. There's just your poetry is rich. You've got lots to offer. It's true. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Where are you ruminating, Mark? All of the places. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I keep coming back down to basics, which is um, the only thing that matters is who we are becoming and what we're doing in that becoming moment by moment because that's what brings about the future. Yep. And I think it's very important not to lose sight of that. Yeah. Well, we're going to be pushed to being different anyway. So, well, I guess what to be a little more precise, like for us to be mattering to the coming about of flourishing, et cetera, for ourselves and ultimately the living world system as a whole, it's um it requires a certain direction of becoming and action taking. And it's not what the human made world is going to afford us. It's going to be done within that context, but um bring about difference from that. Yeah, I just think we have to, to be much more engaged with, with life, with the real world, which is really nature, not the human constructs that we call the real world. It's not a real world. Here, here. Yeah. So, yeah. So this, for me, is a is a step in that direction that people can start to take and then grow from that space as they experience it. Yeah, yeah we don't get to flourishing without becoming... Yeah. nature as individuals and groups and having nature flourish around us <laughs> yeah we won't be here if it doesn't exactly yeah okay see you guys next week okay thank you Wonderful. blessing go well bye bye bye